collected a bunch of questions from readers about writing in general and bones and all in particular. And in some cases, I have written a more extensive answer, so you will find those linked in the description box. Megan asks, what did you want to be when you were young? When I was really little, like five or six, I wanted to be a fashion designer, inspired by Gem and the Holograms, no doubt. But I have a clear memory of when I was nine years old, looking at the bookshelf above my desk and it clicked for me that there was a real person behind each of those novels on my shelf and I realized that that was what I wanted to do someday. And Chantal asks, you have written nonfiction as well as fiction for both children and grown-ups. When you first decided to become a writer, what was it you wanted to write originally? So soon after that bookshelf epiphany, I read Tom's Midnight Garden in my challenge literature class. This was, this was in fourth grade. And from that point, I knew that I wanted to write middle grade fantasy. I'll put a link to my Tom's Midnight Garden book appreciation in the description box. Megan asks, did you study a specific field before starting writing? If yes, what did you study? I studied art history and Irish studies at NYU, and when I graduated in 2002, I already had a partial draft of my what would become my practice novel, and I got a job as an editorial assistant at HarperCollins, so I stayed in New York for two more years, and then I went to Galway in Ireland to get my master's in writing. Megan also says, I don't know if you're writing full time. Did you have a former job? If yes, what was your job position and did this job position help you start writing? I've had plenty of side gigs and day jobs over the years and for an in-depth answer to this question, you can check out these two articles I published on Medium back in 2019. My time at HarperCollins certainly gave me inside knowledge of the publishing industry, which is helpful, though not essential. I found my agent after my boss spoke glowingly of her boss. I checked out the agency website and submitted a query just as any other writer would have. As for the wonderful day job I mentioned in the second Medium article, I had to quit that job in order to move to Washington DC in the fall of 2020. And I spent the following year writing in the morning and caring for my niece in the afternoons. She's back in daycare now and I am writing full time again though I may pick up another part-time gig at some point. Now for some bones and all questions. Rosie asks, did you add any parts of your personality to the characters? Like Lee, I have a younger sister I felt very protective of when we were growing up, so that was definitely what you'd call the seed of his character. As for Marin, I will talk about developing her character using personal experience inside the self-esteem and mental health video on the extended playlist. Megan asks, when you wrote Bones and All, how did you come up with these characters' names? Any inspiration? I have a vague memory of looking in a baby name book in the library right after I got the idea for the novel. I wanted a name that was beautiful, but off kilter just a little bit in the sense that when you see Marin, you might think, is that a typo? Should that read Karen or maybe Maureen? Fun fact, I had never heard of or met a person named Marin until the night of the Bones and All book launch when one of my prize bags was won by a young woman named Marin. And she was a very good sport. And her surname, Yearly, is probably pretty obvious. That's how often she does the bad thing on average. As for Lee, I wanted a very simple, unpretentious, all-American sounding name that also was like potentially anonymous sounding. Okay, spoiler alert, pause the video now if you have not yet finished reading the novel. Maria Teresa writes, souvenirs and totems, specifically as Marin, Sully, and Lee use them, or symbolism, if any. Marin keeps souvenirs as physical representations of her conscience. She may be a monster, but she does experience remorse. And of course, that's the opposite of why Lee and Sully do it. These two characters are diametrically opposed, but this is one thing that they have in common, that their souvenirs function as trophies. For Lee, 
It's a reminder that there is one less cruel human in the world, so he feels like he's done something for humanity despite his monsterhood. Whereas for Sully, these trophies grant him a sense of power and control. I've been thinking about hunting trophies, the sole purpose of which is to prop up the hunter's ego, and also about the bizarre rationale behind taxidermy, which is that you have to kill someone in order to preserve them. And yes, I'm saying someone, not something. Sully's hair rope is a symbol of the narrative that he has crafted for himself over the course of this violent and lonely lifetime. He is casting himself as the hero of his own story. He's created this record of his deeds, this strangely beautiful thing that he's, he's showing off, or it would be strangely beautiful if he hadn't murdered a whole bunch of people in order to create it. Instead, it's proof of his monsterhood, and it's not a sympathetic monsterhood like Marin's or Lee's. At any rate, I could write a whole essay in answer to this question, and perhaps someday I will. Chantal asks, would you write a sequel if the demand was there? No. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously though, this novel was very much an outlier for me. I do enjoy reading and watching horror, but I prefer to write what we might call cozy fantasy. Maria asks, did you know how the novel would end from the beginning or did you let the story take you there? I always knew how it was going to end. With my debut novel, Mary Modern, the the plot, the plot twist, the ending, everything slotted into place in my brain before I had even started drafting in earnest. And something similar happened with Bones and All, but on the whole, when I sit down to write a novel, I am letting the story take me there. Sunsy Garden writes, tell me about choosing to write about controversial topics. Do you care how it might be received? What drives your craft? I love this question because I can write cozy fantasy and I can invite you to consider perspectives that at first might seem strange or unappealing. In my fiction and my nonfiction, I'm definitely interested in examining taboos. So what thoughts are you afraid to think? What questions are you afraid to ask? Why do you believe what you believe and why are you invested in continuing to believe it? How have you constructed this particular identity and how might you disassemble and reconfigure that identity in a way that will lead you to a much greater sense of satisfaction in life? I like to be made to feel uncomfortable in a way that leads me to a place of insight and I want my writing to have that sort of catalytic effect for everyone who reads it. As for caring about the reception, I don't care if someone hates the book and leaves a one-star review on Goodreads. It just means that my book was not for them, and that's fine. Not every novel is gonna be for every reader. I care that the readers who are meant to get it do get it that I, through my work, have helped them to reveal something of intimate significance to themselves. For more on this subject, you will want to read A Bright Clean Mind. Chantal writes, with the movie coming out, Bones and All may easily become your best known book. Are you worried your next book might not live up to fans' expectations? That's a sensible question, but no, and I think that's the benefit of having cultivated a career that is so eclectic, some readers inevitably are only going to read Bones and All, and that's fine. Many more of you are going to read and appreciate my other novels and my other work. And this last one is not a Bones and All specific question, but I will answer it both ways. If you had to choose a favorite character from all of your books, which one would it be and why? My favorite characters in Bones and All are Travis and Mrs. Harmon because they are the kindest people in the book and they both, in their own way, try their best to help Marin to feel less alone in the world. And overall, my favorite character is Evelyn Harbinger from Petty Magic because she is the 
most hilarious, bodiest, bravest character I have ever written. And I still want to be her in my next life. My other favorite is Mrs. Gubbins, the haunted doll in The Boy From Tomorrow. Tim asks, what are your go-to snacks, meals, and or ceremonies before a writing session? I drink coffee with soy or coconut creamer and for breakfast, AKA writing fuel, I will usually have either a smoothie or avocado toast. I was eating avocado toast long before the hipsters got to it, by the way. The essential ingredients for me are salt, pepper, and lemon or lime juice, vinegar in a pinch. The optional ingredients are garlic powder, seaweed flakes, nutritional yeast, and maybe a little bit of sesame oil. I like to top it with pickled onions and black garlic. As for fiction writing warm-up ceremonies, quote unquote, I'll often read a few pages of a book that motivates me to write, so a craft book or a book for research, but the only thing I have to do beforehand is my morning journaling practice, which I prefer to call private writing. If you're interested in how and why I journal and all of the benefits thereof, you will find the link to my private writing workshop video above and below. Megan writes, what are the best conditions for your writing? Do you have anything you hate that prevents you from writing? Now I'm going to channel Stephen Pressfield and or Charles Bukowski here and tell you that pro writers do not wait for the perfect conditions. That said, in the olden days when I used to write at the library, I was consistently frustrated by folks who would use their outdoor voices in the library, uh, make pointless phone calls, and generally behave in an obnoxious fashion. Now that I am exclusively writing at home, I do not have to deal with other people's nonsense, but I do miss the library. Megan asks, any remedy for blank page syndrome? So the whole objective here is to take the pressure off of yourself, lighten up, have fun with it. As Anne Lamott says in Bird by Bird, you can write a line of dialogue like, What's it to you, Mr. Poopy Pants? Nobody's gonna read it. Continue on from there and you'll eventually be warmed up and ready to write for real. Or as another warm-up exercise, you could choose a novel or chapbook on your shelf, jot down the first line, and then take the story in a totally different direction. Though obviously you would not be publishing a line of someone else's work as your own, this is just an exercise. Or you could purposely fall down a research rabbit hole, maybe set a timer for 10 minutes, and then at the end of that 10 minutes, choose the most interesting fact or detail that you came across and use that as a jumping off point. I like to collect prompts I can use when I'm feeling blank and pressured. These are usually project specific, but they certainly don't have to be. I also love making lists. What unusual objects might I find in my character's sock drawer? in their pantry? What are the titles of their overdue library books? What particular smells recall an important memory for them? And so on and so forth. Then you identify the most intriguing item on the list and you run with it. For more ideas, you might want to check out the list of writing prompts in the resource library on my website, as well as my online workshop, The Bright Idea Kit. Megan also asks, any tips to avoid word repetition? This question reminds me of going over first past pages of my debut novel in which the characters seem to be sighing on every page, sometimes more than once per page. And you know, you have to go over it with a fine tooth comb, finer tooth comb, finer tooth comb. And once you are, your eyes are glazing over, then step away from your work. When you come back to it days, weeks, possibly even months later, you are going to be able to spot those word repetitions much more easily. Chantal asks, which one of your fiction projects needed the most research, excluding the time travel novel, which is my current work in progress? Let me put it this way, Bones and All was the only one of my novels that didn't really require much in the way of research. All the other ones did and do. I'd say Petty Magic required the most because of the World War II flashbacks. I had to get the historical details just right. Chantal asks, 
Were you vegan or vegetarian when you wrote Bones and All? And is there any connection to the theme of eating what you love, speciesism? Or is that a coincidence? Yes, I was newly vegan when I got the idea for Bones and All. And let's define speciesism here because I'm thinking that a lot of viewers probably are unfamiliar with that term. Speciesism, coined by Richard Ryder in 1970, is the belief that the human species is inherently superior to other species and so has rights or privileges that are denied to other sentient animals. So humans are at the top and beneath us, we have instituted a hierarchy of perceived worth that can vary from culture to culture. So for instance, Westerners tend to be appalled, irrationally so, that people in China or Vietnam sometimes eat dogs and that people in Japan sometimes hunt and eat dolphins. Here in the US, we revere both of these animals. Their lives have value to us. Here are a couple of tweets from Vegan Fried Chicken to illustrate speciesism. This is the most incisive use of emojis I have ever seen. Some animals we cherish. We care deeply about the feelings and inner lives of our dogs and cats and yet other animals we torture and eat. We don't care at all about their suffering. And the vegan's argument is that this distinction is arbitrary. Much like the distinction between people who make eaters hungry and people who, luckily for them, do not. Who, quote unquote, deserves to live and who must be sacrificed to feed the beast at the center of the labyrinth? In the old Greek myth, victims were chosen by lots. Chantal, you're connecting my joke about Marin eating what she loves to speciesism makes sense. It's a reversal most people would find horrifying, but I don't think I'd made that connection at the time myself. From this 2011 blog post titled, You Always Hurt the One You Love, I started joking about eating what she loves as the second most extreme possible form of self-sabotage, which I will discuss in a video on the extended playlist. Megan writes, I know that veganism has a really important place in your heart and your life. When did you start veganism? Were you young? What kind of advice could you give to someone who wants to start transitioning from Omni to vegetarianism or veganism? I had been vegetarian for over a decade when I went vegan when I was 30, and it is hands down, the best decision I have ever made. I wrote a whole book in answer to your question, Megan, so I hope you will check out A Bright Clean Mind. But in the meantime, I recommend watching the usual documentaries alongside Googling for easy vegan recipes, trying new foods, and having fun experimenting with veganizing your old favorites. The documentaries are important because you need to see and understand just how cruel and environmentally destructive factory farming really is. You will become extremely upset when you see the undercover footage and hear the facts, and then you'll decide to start living in alignment with your values, and there is so much joy and freedom in that. When you're feeling unsure or overwhelmed, remember this. Veganism is a lot easier than it used to be, but you are still going to get pushback from friends, family, random strangers. It takes courage to question the dominant culture. So let yourself feel good about that. Also, be patient with yourself. It takes time to retrain your brain. On day one, you're still seeing bacon as food, but in a few days or weeks, you won't see bacon, you will see pieces of somebody who did not want to die. Same goes for dairy products. On day one, you see cheese or yogurt, and later you only see milk that ought to have nourished a baby cow. I think now's a good time to mention that I am planning a cooking series called No Bones At All. Yay! Jolene asks, is there anything you would do differently if you could? Well, I'm glad to have the opportunity to answer this question for two reasons. Number one, I like to give other people the benefit of my experience to avoid my the mistakes that I've made and the thought traps that I myself have fallen into. And also it's good to look back, reassess, and you know, if you're gonna make changes, do things differently in the future, it's good to know. Regrets are useful in that way. I do believe the choices we make put us on the path that we are meant to be on. 
That said, if I had my 20s to live over again, I probably would go back for a degree in counseling, which I can still do in my 40s. I wish I'd taken myself less seriously. I wish I had evolved from the ego-driven push to achievement mindset into the contribution mindset that I talk about in Life Without Envy. I wish I had made that evolution a few years sooner. For more where this came from, check out my Office Hours series on YouTube and Instagram. This is the last video in the Bones and All Book to Film public playlist. And if you're on my mailing list, you'll be receiving the link to the extended playlist. If you're not already on my mailing list, look for the sign up link in the description box below. Thanks so much for asking such good questions and for all of the enthusiasm and support that you have shown both for me and my novel and for everyone involved in the film adaptation.